Yeah, thanks, and uh, good morning, everyone. When the slides come up here, what I want to do is, is basically to, to connect together to, to Valerie's, Helen's, and, and Detlef's talks here, and I think it's, uh, or hopefully it's becoming very clear to all of us that uh, we have a, a tremendous conundrum in front of us. On the one hand, we have more science than ever before showing that even at 1.5 degrees Celsius, we are facing major irreversibilities, increased extremes, really big challenges for communities, societies, the economy, the world. But at the same time, as that Detlef pointed out, we're so close that we're very likely to uh, miss that target, at least on the short term. And the question is, can we cope with this, given that we have so much support now that 1.5 is not a, a, a compromise number from political negotiations, it really has a very strong scientific meaning for our future on Earth. And we're following the 2.7 degrees Celsius pathway, as you know, from the latest update, all the nationally determined contributions of the countries gathered here in Glasgow. 2.7, as Helen pointed out, is uh, you know, a level of global warming that we cannot even say scientifically that we are uh, you know, able to manage. In fact, it is the global mean temperature on Earth we haven't seen on Earth for the past four or five million years. Just over the past three million years, the latest scientific uh, findings, not in the IPCC, because it's the first time a climate model is able to reproduce the entire glacial interglacial cycling over the entire quaternary geological period, shows that we never passed two degrees. This is run with a climber model at the Potsdam Institute, and this just gives us a reminder that the corridor of life on Earth is very narrow. You know, the warmest point seems to be not even approaching, <clears throat> just, just approaching two, and cold points, deep ice ages, is somewhere between minus four to minus six degrees Celsius of global mean temperature. So we're truly, you know, outside of the range of anything that uh, uh, gives us confidence of how we can manage this. So the, the urgency point that Detler pointed out has very strong scientific support. In fact, I would argue that the AR6 is, is the most significant scientific platform of evidence we've ever had. This is just one way of showing the, the, the advancements of science over just two IPCC assessments. What you see here is the number of times in the fifth assessment that you scientifically find statements of median to high confidence. It was 100 times in the fifth assessment, but 180 times in the sixth assessment. So it is clear that the more observations, the more analytics, the more modeling, the more scientific efforts of understanding the complex coupled Earth system, the higher confidence levels do we have in terms of climate sensitivity, in terms of everything that Helen has shared with us here earlier. So this is really important that politically there is no excuse to, to not act with urgency with the evidence we have today. In fact, the journey of the science, I would argue, is, is, is really quite, um, quite dramatic. What you have here is the very famous red embers diagrams of science. The darker the red, the higher is the confidence of risk. This is the red embers evolution over four IPCC um, cycles from 2001, 20 years ago, until the 1.5 degrees Celsius report uh, in, in 2018. What you have on the x-axis here is global mean temperature. And what you see is that 20 years ago, the scientific assessment, the best scientific assessment, was that the risk of large-scale discontinuities crossing the tipping points that Helen showed was scientifically assessed to be you know, somewhere up at 5, 6 degrees Celsius of global mean temperature rise. That was not a risk because nobody was suggesting that we would reach such disastrous levels of warming. So the assessment 20 years ago was basically zero risk. Look at the situation today. We are today, just as Helen showed, as Detlef showed, as Valerie showed, at a situation where the red is blinking already at a two degree Celsius point. Not that we can say for certain, as has been very clear in the IPCC. We're talking many times about low probability, high uncertainty, but very large impacts because these are irreversible changes. But as, as Helen pointed out, tipping points cannot be ruled out. And this is what the warning signs are all about, that we need to take a precautionary approach in this transition phase. Now, 
the mapping of the tipping elements that have now been so, so well represented in the IPCC 6 assessment were published the first time in 2008. This is the classic first mapping of the 15 tipping point systems that regulates the state of the climate system and that have multiple stable states. So this is actually where it all started. It's not so long time back. Then 10 years on, we did the 10-year the update of the tipping element system, so just before the IPC assessment comes out. And we show that nine, shown here, of the 15 systems are showing signs of instability, meaning that they may be approaching tipping points. And we have a lot of paleoclimatic data and evidence showing that these systems have multiple stable state, that a rainforest can, if it's pushed too far, tip over into an irreversible journey towards a savanna state, that you can have you know, stable ice sheet or destabilized darker surfaces with more liquid water. These are multiple stable states that we have, need to have a very, very close eye on because they regulate ultimately the climate sensitivity and the state of your system. But the key scientific frontier on this assessment was not even the assessment of risks relating to instability of tipping elements. And just to remind, I mean, as, as Helen pointed out, the IPC6 assessment puts its fingers on the green ice sheet Arctic sea ice, the Atlantic circulation, the, the AMOC system, the West Antarctic ice shelf, the permafrost thawing. So, so six of the 15 are already in the IPCC 6 assessment. But what I find really important to recognize is that the scientific frontier is actually starting to show that these systems have interconnectivity. For example, that when the Greenland ice sheet melts so fast, releasing cold fresh water, this is very likely the reason why we have a slowdown of the overturning of heat in the North Atlantic that Helen pointed out. That in turn may have an impact on the monsoons in the tropical regions, which may explain the higher degree of droughts and fires in the Brazilian part of the Amazon. But also, with, with a slowdown of the overturning, you will have more warm surface water in the Southern Ocean, which may explain why we have accelerated melting in the West Antarctic ice shelf. So you have this interconnectivity between the Arctic and Antarctica. And this is particularly worrying in a situation where you have such an amplified, accelerated melting and warming up in the Arctic, with two to three degrees Celsius of warming when the world is warming with 1.1 degrees Celsius. So this is a scientific frontier. So one has to recognize that the IPCC, which is such a tremendous effort across the entire scientific community, is the baseline upon which we all agree upon. But then we have the frontier where we're always advancing the science, and this is one part of that. Not resolved yet, we're working on this very hard, but it's just again piece of evidence of the need for precaution. I just want to also send one second reminder, which is what, what both Detlef and, and Helen pointed out is this journey towards a net zero world economy required for us to have any chance of holding the Paris Agreement range of well below two, which gives us something between 400 and 500 billion tons of carbon dioxide in a remaining global carbon budget. I mean, this is the biggest transformation of the world energy system ever. But that won't be enough. That is what is so important. Helen pointed out this, this risk of us um, shifting biochemical cycles in the Earth system and that they may not, if they tip, be uh, a, such a large emitter as the anthropogenic emissions. However, one should remember that they are carbon sinks today, that intact nature on land and the ocean absorb in the order of 56% of, of our emissions of greenhouse gases, shown here is the negative emissions on land and in, in the oceans. Now, the dramatic message, if you really dig into the climate models, is that the only reason why the IPCC provides us in the world with a remaining carbon budget of roughly four to 500 gigatons is that the models assume that the carbon sink capacity in intact nature will continue. It will continue. So not only are we assuming that biological systems will not cross tipping points. We're also assuming that the stocks of carbon in forests, in soils, in wetlands, in permafrost remain reasonably intact over the next 50 years. That is quite an optimistic assumption because it means we need to invest in conserving the remaining intact ecosystems. So this is a, a message in Glasgow. It won't be enough to decarbonize the energy system. We have to have a full transformation of all the components in the Earth system. 
But just the journey on, on, on energy is, as you know, tremendous. This is what happens for the US, the European Union, and China if they are to deliver on their pledges that they have brought with them to Glasgow. Just look at the pace. I mean, we're talking about racing to zero. And now we need every country in the world to do the same. What is India doing, Russia, Indonesia? So this is why it is an urgency point, that that is what is on, this, on stake here. And at the same time, we need to maintain and secure all the sinks and stocks in the living biosphere. I just want to close by, by reminding you that you know, this, this is a science session we have here today. We're all gathered here as, as a kind of concerned, engaged persons in this transition. But we got a very, very important result in an opinion poll we just carried out a few weeks ago, which actually surprised even me, who've been working on, on the kind of tipping point work for, for so long. We did an opinion poll with all the G20 countries across the largest economies in the world, asking the question, not, not if you are concerned about climate change, not if you trust climate science, but the question for the first time, are you concerned of the risk of crossing tipping points? And can you imagine, 73% of the respondents answered yes. We are concerned about tipping points. We're concerned about irreversibilities and long-term commitments. I would argue personally that this is exactly what the youth movement is really concerned about, that we're handing over a planet that irreversibly is moving, drifting away from a livable state towards a less and less livable state. Not that we're crossing some catastrophic threshold, but that it's just sliding in the wrong direction. But this is interesting, and, and we even had to go back and check if the data was somehow biased in any way, because I had not expected that that level of awareness is out there of the risks worth taking. So I think we have a lot of confidence of moving forward. And as was asked, what could be three scientific challenges moving forward? Well, my top three would be, along with, with Detlef's point about a more integrated Earth system understanding about connections, cascades, tipping points. We're actually launching now together with the World Climate Research Program, so something called the TIPMIP, the Tipping Point Model into Comparison Project, which we do with Future Earth and the Earth Commission, to gather the scientific community to address exactly the points that Helen was sharing about the confidence levels of understanding risks, probabilities of crossing thresholds in the Earth system. We're also really exploring more and more social tipping points. How do we get on board S-curves of positive change that can really accelerate the pathway towards a zero carbon nature positive future? And finally, I think it's time for us to really start gathering the scientific community around the earth sciences and the political sciences around governance. We need to become governance of the entire planetary system. In fact, we are now proposing to redefine the global commons in the Anthropocene. The global commons in the Anthropocene must be the tipping elements. We all depend on them. They are no longer just the high seas and, and space and Antarctica systems that are outside of national jurisdictions. They're inside national jurisdictions, yes, but they are big biomes, big biophysical systems that we all depend on as citizens on Earth for the stability of the world. And we think that this is now something we need to you know, raise much, much higher up on the agenda. So some challenges there for the years to come to tip this over in the right direction in terms of a journey towards the desired outcomes that we're all aiming for here in Glasgow. So with that, um, back to you, Helen, I think, in the studio somewhere, somewhere in the world. Yes.